So I'm, I'm backstage about ready to walk out too, and, and uh, the clip on my mic falls apart as well. And so this thing was like stuck into, like through my jean pocket back here, and I'm trying to rip everything apart. And I'm like, I got to get up on stage. And, and so anyway, I want you guys to take a journey with me back to your elementary days. Remember that? Remember being an elementary kid? If uh, you're like me, that was a long time ago. Maybe a little difficult to, to remember a little bit. But remember when you were an elementary child and it was time for recess or PE class, there was going to be a kickball uh, game or something, something like that, you know, and what was the process? There would be two captains, right? And then the captains would start picking everybody one at a time until everybody uh, was gone, right? Until everybody had been chosen. Originally, I was going to ask who were the ones who, who were chosen first or second. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands for that because the rest of us resent you and still kind of hold a little bitterness towards you, but uh, you're you were like the athletes, probably the popular ones, that sort of thing. For the rest of us, chosen like close to last or last, you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's a memory we prefer not to remember, you know. The Beatitudes are kind of similar to that because we love the Beatitudes, right? If you're familiar with those, we love them until we get to this one we're talking about today, which is persecution, Right? Like, like if, if you had the opportunity and you could pick one or two or three of the Beatitudes that you wanted to be part of your life, you would not pick this one. The Beatitudes would always be picked last, wouldn't it? Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 says, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, I would love to have the kingdom of heaven. I would love to have God's blessings. I'm not so sure about the persecution part, though. I don't think I really want that. The message paraphrases it like this. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. You look up the word persecution in the dictionary. It's defined as hostility and ill treatment, especially because of race or political or religious beliefs, hostility or ill treatment. I believe there's an intentional reason why Jesus saved this one for last. If he would have led with this one, how many people would have kept listening? I mean, you ever thought about that? You know, and even some scholars believe that all of these beatitudes kind of build one on top of another. Like, if, for example, if you went back and you just looked at this whole beatitude series from the very beginning, you can kind of see this progression of, of uh, for lack of a better term, difficulty in in these beatitudes. They kind of grow to this point that leads us to this one, and 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 persecution. I think is 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 at the end because persecution is a product of all of the other beatitudes that's the bottom line for today it's a product when we do the first seven beatitudes well the result oftentimes will be persecution how awesome is that right right we love the sound of the beatitudes we love the sound of being blessed i love the sound of of, of god bless me when i'm poor bless me when i'm mourn. bless me when, when when i'm hungry but i'm telling you you begin to get those first seven beatitudes right You begin to knock those out of the park. And I'm telling you, you are right on track, right? You feel like you have developed into a strong Christian. Your faith is strong. You have a great foundation. You're right on track for number eight to come up and knock you right over a cliff. And we have to be ready for it. Persecution follows the one who follows Jesus. Maybe that should be the bottom line. Persecution follows the one who follows Jesus. Jesus, Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Like nobody ever put that one on a t-shirt, right? Right? That's not not the one that we we latched onto. Nobody made one of those little images you see on Instagram with the big mountain or the sunset or, or the beach or something like that and put this one on there. Like we don't perk up at that one, do we? Right? We don't like those kind of verses. We latch on to the I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me verses, right? We hold on to the for God so loved the world verses. And and I'm fairly certain since the life of the apostle Paul, no one has ever said and meant his words in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. That's why I take pleasure (laughs) in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ, 
I take pleasure. I, the, he's, he just sounds like he needs to be locked up in a mental institution somewhere, right? Yes. Yeah, that's exactly the way he sounds. But we love the end of this, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Put that one on the t-shirt, but we forget what comes right before that, don't we? It's not really the life I signed up for when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, right? I became a Christian because Jesus was supposed to fix all of my problems. Nobody ever told me that the result of being a follower of Jesus would be persecution. And Jesus said this in Matthew 24, verse 9. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. I don't know about y'all. I took one of those little white out bottles. You know what I'm talking about? You know, you pull it out. It looks like, like fingernail polish, but it's, it's not. It's like a little white, white brush sort of thing. I just, I just whited out verse, verse nine right there. You know, I'm just like, that ain't part of my Bible anymore, God. Don't you wish it could be like that sometimes? Wouldn't that be awesome, right? I'm not, I'm not taking that part. I, I, don't, I don't think you and I here in America can, tr- can truly comprehend the word persecution, To be arrested, persecuted, hated, maybe even killed, all because you love Jesus. It's it's not really something we, at least right now in our culture, have to deal with. People on the other side of the globe, though, people on the other side of the globe are losing their lives for doing exactly what we are doing in this very room right now. They're being killed for that. And while you and I may not be experiencing this kind of persecution here and now, I do believe it's something that it would not take too much for us to be very far from in our country. And so we have to be prepared. It's not something that the Bible says might happen. It will. We have to be ready. We have to be trained up. That's the question. Are, are, are you ready for it? Do you feel like you're strong enough for some sort of persecution like that. I know many of you are currently serving in the military you have in the past. If that's you, thank you uh, for your service. When, when I, uh, for me personally, when I joined the Air Force, or as some of you say the Chair Force, uh, I, I didn't necessarily, I'll just admit to you, I didn't necessarily join because I had like this, this overflowing uh, heart of a patriot sort of sort of thing, you know. It wasn't that I hated my country; I loved my country, but it wasn't what it is now. What the what the military developed in me, you know. It, it wasn't because I, I wanted to go fight for my country. The main reason why I joined the Air Force was because I didn't know what else to do with my life, you know. <laughs> and uh, and I don't, I do not regret it whatsoever. They made me grow up really, really fast. I got to see a whole lot of the world. They paid for most of my education. Um, And through the process, I discovered what a real patriot does look like. And here's the thing. On my first day in the Air Force, they didn't just sit me down in a jet and and say, go go fly over there and drop some bombs. Right? They didn't put a wrench in, in my hand and say, go fix that helicopter. They didn't even give me a gun on my first day. You know why, right? I wasn't trained up. Right? I, wasn't, I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't ready to go into battle. Likewise, friends, I believe it's only a matter of time before real persecution, not just being made fun of for being a follower of Jesus, but very real persecution, like a gun is going to be put in your face and somebody says, do you believe in Jesus? Do you follow Jesus? And, it, and by the way, if you say yes, I'm pulling the trigger. We might not be very far away from that. Are you ready for it? And so here's my goal today. Knowing that persecution could be dropped on us at at any moment. I want us to walk out of here ready for it. I want us to walk out of here prepared and trained up and ready for it. And to do that, I want to look at an Old Testament account that many of you, if you grew up in church, you're very familiar with. It's in Daniel chapter 3. If you got your Bible, you can turn there. Daniel uh, chapter 3. If you grew up in church going to Sunday school, this was one of the core stories that we learned about over and over and over again. It's such a popular story. Veggie Tales made a video out of it called Rack Shack and Benny. Right? So let's jump into this. It, it wasn't in a sacred temple or a worship auditorium like this one we sit in today, where some of the greatest praise began to rise up. It was in a fiery furnace, a blazing pit, 
Daniel paints this picture that I feel is all too relevant for you and me today in 2022. The Babylonian culture back then is infiltrating the sacred places, the houses of God, the temples. And now the Babylonians, they're telling everybody there's not just one true God. There are many gods that we should pray to and worship. And while you and I today, I do believe there's only one true God, our culture would want us to believe that there are many. The God of money, the God of power, the God of fame, the God of recognition. Have you thought of that one? I, I don't think it was as severe when I was growing up at least. But today, especially with social media, there's so many people who have gotten really addicted to the recognition. They find their value in the recognition, in the selfie that they post, and how many followers do I have, and how many comments came under that. And I'm not just talking about teenagers posting selfies about them, uh, you know, of themselves. I, I, know, I know many pastors, several pastors of large churches even, very large churches. And the very first thing that they do on Sunday afternoon after the services are done is they go onto the church Facebook page to look at all of the comments underneath the live stream from that day. And if one negative thing is said, it eats them alive for the next week. It's where we find confidence in ourselves and we can get addicted to that recognition. There's so many things in this life in our culture that can become our God and take our focus off of the one true God. And it was exactly the same back then, except they had all kinds of weird gods, like really, really just, just weird things. They're worshiping all kinds of idols. The king, his name is Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to call him King Neb, okay? And he decides that he's going to take all of the young, brilliant, smart leaders who are part of God's kingdom <coughs> and try to convert them, actually force them uh, to be part of his own kingdom. King Neb takes three of these guys. The names you probably will not recognize in the beginning. Most people won't recognize these names. Three guys along with uh, Daniel, we see them in chapter 1, verse 6, actually. The first one was Hananiah. His name meant gift of the Lord. <clears throat> the second was Mishael, whose name meant who is like our Lord. And the third was Azariah, whose name meant God helps us. All three were named about this one true God, the God whom they loved, the God whom they serve. King Neb comes along and he decides to change their names, the names that you will recognize from Sunday school growing up, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, which meant moon god. Meshach, which meant the god of a coup. And Abednego, which meant the servant of Nego. Change their names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not their names, right? They tried to change. King Nebuchadnezzar tried to change who they were on the inside by changing their names on the outside. And if you're familiar with the story, you know it didn't work, did it? It didn't work. When they were offered food that defiled their bodies, they refused to eat the food. When they were told to worship gods who were not the one true God, they refused. When they were told to pray to idols, they refused. They were persecuted and they were blessed. And that persecution, here's what it can do for you. It can deepen that conviction that you have even more. That's what persecution can do for you and me. It can deepen your conviction. The stories of encouragement in the Bible that we love, right? Those stories we prefer to read, the passages in the Bible that we love, the I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, those stories, those accounts, those, those verses, what we, what we forget all too often is that most of them, many of them were birthed out of persecution. That's where they came from. The entire reason the Apostle Paul got to the point in his life where he could say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me is because of what his past had taken him through. Persecution can deepen your conviction in Christ. So here's, here's all, all these people, these other people, they're, they're, they're coming to King Neb and, and they're sucking up to him, right? May the king live forever, right? They're brown nosers, you know, just trying to build him up, trying to get on the king's good side. They're tattletales as well. They're snitches, right? And they, they tell King Neb about these three guys who refuse to bow down and worship the false idols. And they, re, they, they remind the king that he had decreed that anyone who refused 
uh, would be thrown into this, this blazing furnace. So here are these three men living a righteous life, wholeheartedly living for the one true God. And what happens? Persecution, right? They're persecuted. They're living out the first seven Beatitudes. And when you live out the first seven Beatitudes, the product of that is oftentimes persecution. These three men, they come before the king. And the king gives them this ultimatum. Either bow down and worship this idol or you will be thrown into the fiery pit, the blazing furnace. You know, persecution often comes in the form of ultimatums. Often. If you do this, then you'll live. If you don't do that, then you'll die. And here's how they reply. In Daniel chapter 3, beginning with verse 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. You recognize that they did not say, our God whom we serve will save us. They recognize the power of their God. He's able to. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. They're very respectful, right? But even if he does not, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Persecution. When, when persecution hits you, how are you going to respond? You need to go ahead and decide that right here, right now. You ought to go ahead and decide, here's how I'm going to respond in the face of persecution because we are promised that it will come. It's not a matter of might, it, 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 it is. It will hit you at some point in time. When you are told that you can no longer pray in school or in your workplace, how will you respond? When you are told you can no longer wear that cross around your neck, how will you respond? When you're told you can't carry around your Bible or read it in public, how will you respond? You can go ahead and decide that here and now. You will will be persecuted and that persecution should ought to deepen our conviction. Will you be able to stand strong knowing God has got my back? God will take care of me one way or another. And even if in this very moment, in this fire, he does not, I know that he still has me and he still will take care of me. I know that. I know that. I will not bow down to your idol. You live out these first seven beatitudes. Persecution is right around the corner. Y'all, it's a product of the first seven. And I, I, like I said earlier, I don't think it's going to come in the form of just making fun of you. Churches around the globe are being shut down and burned down. Christians, thousands upon thousands of people are being killed for worshiping the one true God. When that happens to us, will you stand strong? Will you be firm in your conviction? In the face of persecution. Persecution, it can increase your awareness too. The, the king throws him into the furnace. Actually, actually first the, the king, he's so furious. This is hilarious, okay? I, I don't know if you ever thought about this. I never thought about this until I was listening to a guy talking and teaching about uh, the, this, this account this past week. And, uh, and, and he's talking about the fact that the king's so furious, he says, heat the furnace up seven times hotter, right? That's what he says. And, and the guy was like, you know, you ever thought about how dumb the enemy is, right? Like, does it really matter whether the furnace is heated up seven times or not? Whether it's heated up any more than it normally is or seven times, it doesn't matter. You're still getting burned up, right? It's so dumb. You know the difference? What difference does that make? You know what the difference is? It's because the imminent enemy is hoping to intimidate you. That's the difference, the enemy is hoping to intimidate you into a point of submission, into a point that you will be so scared, so afraid that you will turn your back upon God. It doesn't matter whether it's turned up seven times, 20 times, 50 times, or, or just the normal time, right? It's still hot enough that it's going to burn up. It's one of his favorite tap tactics. You know, you know what happened though, right? If you're familiar with the story, they're, they're thrown into the blazing furnace, but they don't burn up, right? 
The guys don't burn up. Daniel chapter 3, here's how King Neb responds. It says, but suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. He's glowing, he's shining, right? That sort of thing. He's got, he's got the chocolate bars and the marshmallows ready to have some s'mores with the guys, you know, that sort of thing. That's how the Clevenger translation would interpret it probably. What is amazing to me is the entire time they're in the furnace, they weren't by themselves. Maybe the main thing you just need to be reminded of this morning, in the midst of the fire, that you're not by yourself. That no matter how hot the fire is, you may be going, you may, you may find yourself right smack dab in the middle of a fiery pit that's seven times hotter than anything you've ever endured before in your entire life. Maybe you just need to remind it that Jesus is still with you. He's not far off. He's not a God that doesn't care and says, good luck to you, mean it. He's not on the outside of the fiery pit, the furnace cheering you on saying, you can do it, I believe in you. Jesus is right there in the middle of the fire with you the entire time. Let me point out something else that I believe as well. I don't know if you've ever noticed, this hit me just yesterday as I was run, running through this message for today and just kind of marinating on things and letting it sink in and just like, whoa, I never thought of it like, like that. So I wanna increase your awareness just a little bit here, right? Okay, how many men were thrown into the prison? Are you all still awake? How many men were thrown into the prison? How many men did King Neb see? Four. I believe that as they were thrown into that fire, the Lord was already there waiting on them. How many times have we found ourselves in this difficult situation, this fiery pit, this furnace, that sort of thing, and then we're like, God, God, don't, 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 don't you see what I'm going through? Can't you see what I'm going through? Yeah, he can, because he was there when you got there in the first place. He already knows all about it. He's right there with you, and we forget that all so easily. When you live out these first seven Beatitudes, the eighth one's going to be right there. It's a product of the first Seven, when the enemy sees you living out those first seven beatitudes, he is going to break open the arsenal upon you to try to knock you out. But be aware, be aware of that, that the enemy's coming after you. He wants to kill and steal and destroy you. Be aware of that. But also be aware that our Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. One more thing persecution can do for you. It can, that we see here, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it can further your position. The king's eyes, as a result of this experience, his eyes are opened. The guys come out of the service, out of the, uh, the furnace, and, and not a hair on their head is singed. Their clothes, we're told, are not scorched. We're told in scripture that they don't even smell of smoke, right? And the king's eyes are opened and he praises the one true God. He recognizes the one true God who saved them. He recognized, and here's his word straight from scripture, that there is no other God who can rescue like this. Maybe that's all you need to hear today. There is no other God who can rescue you like that. And then in verse 30, it says, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. Because these three men stood strong in the face of persecution, their faith, their boldness touched the most powerful man in their kingdom of their day. And because he was touched, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are promoted to a place where even more people may be influenced by them. Listen to me now. If you are not ready for persecution, you will find a lot of things in your life take you out, 
that actually God can use to build you up. But God will wrestle to use those things to build you up if we do not have a proper perspective of persecution, a proper mindset of persecution. Persecution is not actually a bad thing, even though it may hurt while you're going through it. It's confirmation that you're knocking the first seven Beatitudes out of the park. That's what it is. Because persecution is a product of all of the other Beatitudes. We're coming into our time of communion this morning. If you want to go ahead and take out your communion cup and open that up. I want to go back to Matthew chapter 24, verse 9 that we read earlier. From the very mouth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. A perfect picture, a perfect example for each of us in what persecution is going to do, how it can affect us, what we can expect even. Jesus said this, then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And that's exactly what happened to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All these people loved him in the beginning. Like, have have you heard about what Jesus can do? The miracles, right? He's healing people. He's making blind people see, lame people walk, deaf people hear. He's driving out demons. He even raised dead people back to life. We love this guy, you know, until one day they turn. Jesus is arrested. He is persecuted and killed for you and for me. Also that our sins may be forgiven so that we may be freed of our sin. I want you to remember that today. This little cracker piece of bread that you hold in your hand represents the body of Jesus Christ broken on for you on the cross cup of juice represents his blood shed for you. We're told in scripture to not partake of those emblems if our hearts are not right and if we have uh, something going on with a brother or sister, some sort of tension, something that we need to make right. So we take this time very seriously. We remember what Jesus Christ did for us, how he was arrested, persecuted, killed, But what that passage doesn't say is there's more to the story as well, right? That we celebrate. He rose from the dead. He rose from the grave. He lives. And I believe that's exactly what he wants for you and me today as well. Even amidst the fiery furnace that feels like it's burning seven times hotter, you may feel like you're right smack dab in the middle of. Remember, he's there with you. He was waiting for you even when you entered into that fire. That's why he died for you on that cross. Let's pray. Afterwards, you may partake of those emblems and then we'll continue to worship. Father God, thank you for this day. God in heaven, we thank you for your grace. And while I feel like I should pray and thank you for times of persecution, we don't really want to. It's not what we want to do. We don't look forward to those times, those moments, those seasons. Father, I pray today that we will be ready. You'll help us stand strong in the face of any kind of persecution that we may face. That we would remember 
the greatest sacrifice of all, Jesus Christ, given his one and only life to die on a cross, that whosoever shall believe shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God, we take these emblems now in remembrance of the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may partake of those emblems when you...